Hey guys, it's Conrad the Bobby Luck here, CEO of Investor Spine Real Estate and author of Australian Property Finance Made Simple. And welcome to today's video. I've had a lot of inquiries um, recently in the last few months um, with people emailing me asking me, when are you going to do the next YouTube video? And to be, to be honest with you, um, I've been skiing and, and taking holidays, um, escaping the hot or the cold Melbourne weather, I should say. Um, into hotter places and then coming back and doing a bit of skiing and in the interim looking after my clients and helping them build their property portfolio. So I've been really busy at the moment, working hard, getting them really good deals at the bottom of the property cycle. And so I thought I'd make this video today about where Melbourne is exactly currently in the property cycle and more importantly, what it means to you as an investor because a lot of you have now either taken action or are thinking maybe you've missed the boat for this property cycle. So I'm going to cover some of the key indicators that have emerged in the marketplace and talk about some of the opportunities and some of the things you can experience as an investor in the next 6 to 12 months in Melbourne in terms of capital growth potential, rental yields, and which areas to avoid and which areas to target in order to maximise your returns. So definitely this is going to be a great video and thank you for, for tuning in to my YouTube channel. Before I go on, a bit of a personal disclaimer, I have never met you in person, I haven't analysed your risk profile, therefore any information I'm giving you today is just pure education. It is not uh, deemed to be financial advice. And look, there's no guarantees in life, just like joining a gym doesn't mean you're going to put on weight and become strong, you've got to do the heavy lifting, you've got to, do, you've got to commit your time, and therefore you're going to get results. Just like property investing, nothing's easy. Having said that, for those of you who have never heard me uh, speak before, just about myself a little bit, um, actually um, I am a real estate agent in Melbourne, I run a real estate agency called Investors Prime Real Estate, which we focus on purely sourcing properties for investors, we don't do any owner-occupied properties at all. I also have a background in mortgage broking and finance, which has been my whole career, and banking and funds management and financial planning. So I've got a very extensive financial services industry background. Having said that, the most important thing about me, and this is the reason why I'm talking to you today, is that I'm actually a property investor myself, so I'm keeping it real, investing in properties, doing deals, and uh, having my ear on the ground, so to speak, and listening to what, exactly what's happening out there, talking to other agents, investors, but also having my finger on the pulse and understanding what's happening in the market, in different markets of Melbourne, because Melbourne really isn't one market anymore, it's eight distinctive markets. I'm also the author of Australian Property Finance Made Simple, which you can buy by going to my website, bookonfinance.com.au. You're going to get a lot of wonderful freebies there as well by buying the book, or go to Amazon or any good bookshop around Australia. Now, let's get into it. I keep coming back to these stats, and you would have seen this on other videos. This is the reality of current, the current reality of the situation. I don't think this is going to change this time around in this property cycle. You know, I love to tell you that Australians are going to get educated and finally everyone going to start buying properties. The thing I don't really get about people is this. I see people coming in on 100 grand a year, 150 grand a year, they're paying 20 to $50,000 in tax. If they buy a townhouse in, in Melbourne for let's say 700 to a million, that property is cash flow positive from day one, which including negative gearing. It's cash flow positive. But that's not the reason you buy property. You don't buy property just to get rid of your tax. You're buying that property because that million dollar townhouse will give you six to 8% growth every year. You're making 60 to 80 grand in capital, which is real money, by the way. Capital can be turned into cash. Believe me, I've bought cars, holidays with capital, with taking equity out of your property. It's real cash. Why don't they do it? I don't understand what people need to learn beyond the obvious of either the next 12 months, you're going to earn 150 grand and pay 50 grand in tax, or you're going to buy a property, save 20 grand in tax, and end up with cash flow positive income per week in your pocket, plus make 60 to 80 grand at the end of the year in capital appreciation. Beyond that, is there anything else that you need to understand? Like to me, that, that is it. Once I got that, it's, I just have to do this over and over and over. I haven't stopped. The thing is, I got this when I was 18. I got this before I even had a job. Um, while I was working at Woolies part-time when I was at uni, um, stacking shelves. But I already knew when I was working at Woolies, this is what I have to do. I've got to buy a property and start claiming tax deductions. And um, 
it really, the fundamentals have never changed in the property market. That's the reality. But the reality is always the very small amount of people actually get to more than six properties, which is around less than 1%. You know, the majority of investors have only one property, which is 72% of investors. 1% own more than six properties. And what I've been interested in doing is researching these this small percentage of investors that represent these six, six or more, um, or these investors, that 1% club that I call, they have more than six properties. Why is it that so few people will actually build large property portfolios? Simply is because they have no plan. They have a buy, hold, and pray to God strategy. Please God, let, me, <laughs> let that property in Brunswick go up in value so I can get my red Ferrari strategy. There's no strategy, there's no planning, there's nothing. You know, and that, that's the reality why people never get over the second or third property, if they even get one property in the first place. So my objective really with these videos on YouTube is to give you enough education and knowledge and inspiration to go out there and start buying properties and build wealth. And you don't have to do it through me, you can just do it through anyone, as long as you're getting the right information and the right, targeting the right areas. Um, because there has to be a better outcome than just paying tax and doing nothing. I mean, that to me is just craziness. So when is the best time to invest in real estate? A lot of people think they can time the market, and I don't believe in timing the market at all. I believe it's time in the market, not timing of the market. And I'm going to explain why in this video from different points of view. The people that believe they can time the market will not succeed long term, or they'll have that idea initially when they're starting out, they'll hold that psychological belief system and eventually, when they get to five, ten properties, they'll leave that psychology far behind. It's the same thing with this obsession with getting the lowest interest rate. When you start off investing, people always say, what's your lowest rate? What's your lowest rate? Eventually, you work out the rate is actually relevant. It's the flexibility of the structure that's going to make you money long term, never the interest rate. But initially, you kind of don't even know what to ask. <clears throat> so you have to ask something. So you ask the broker, what's your cheapest interest rate? The people that are obsessed with timing the market always think, well, I'm just going to wait and get it at the very bottom and get all the bargains. Well, let me tell you something. The bottom was in February this year. And it is, the bottom is here right now. So if you're one of the uh, engineering people out there who's obsessed with timing the market, this is it, boys and girls. You gotta jump in because already the tide has turned and the ship is leaving as we speak. So if you're not jumping in now for those who wanna time the market, um, when are you gonna jump in? Because the next time around it could be 10 years. So when's the best time to get fit? That's another good question, is whenever you can. Getting fit is not about going to the gym a month before summer, hoping you can put on some muscles and lose body fat. You know, as a powerlifter, I can tell you now, the boys get fit during the winter seasons. That's when you build the body. When do you build your property portfolio? Not at the bottom of the market or the top. You build it throughout the whole phase. You build it, you just keep building. It's consistent implementation over an extended period of time that gives you success, not sporadic, one-off, extreme bursts of energy. That creates frustration at, at the very, very um, least. If anything, creates failure because you can't sustain that level of, of energy, you know. But this is what happens with powerlifting. You know, I train at, uh, I actually have a home gym, which is a commercially great, graded equipment at home. But anyway, I go to a gym for powerlifting this is what happens every year. December, there's no one in there. January the 2nd, not January the 1st, because everyone's got a hangover, right, after New Year's. January the 2nd, this is the gym, right? I see all the people with the little programs walking around with the brand new Brooks, with the matching socks and the matching singlets, trying to work out all the machines. Ooh, what does that do? What does that do? And this is what happens. December, no one. January, can't move in the place. February, no one. All gone. They've all failed now because they go in on the 2nd of January. And I love the thing about December. Yeah, man, I'm just going to pick out in December, uh, eat whatever I want. And then January the 2nd, I'm in the gym. I'm going to smash it. You know, that's it. It's over. This is the year I'm going to do it. I'm going to get the membership. In fact, I'm going to get it earlier and start on the 2nd of February, of January. And guess what? They go to fitness first. <laughs> <laughs> or the other, or the 24-hour gyms that are popping out everywhere with uh, instructors that don't know anything about anything. They join up, they go into a 12-month program. It's usually $1,200 $1, or $1,600 per year. They get sore after a week, and on the first, second week of January, they quit, and they're out of it, and they're gone. The boys build the body, 
in the off season. That's when you build your portfolio off season. The people that think they're going to get fit six weeks before summer, these people here, they never succeed. These are the same people they think they're going to time the market. Yeah, next time the property cycle comes around at the bottom, I'm going to go all in. Well, you can't go all in because the dynamics have shifted this time around because there's virtually no stock on the market at the moment and you're paying over above reserve. So there are no bargains at this time around. The bargains were here last year when the market was going down. So even though you can get in right now, the price point has already shifted in Melbourne, which is very interesting. So let me tell you something. Be this guy here. Invest whenever you can invest. Consistent performance over an extended period of time. Don't buy into this bullshit of joining the gym on the 2nd of January, thinking you're going to be the next 12 months. Don't do it. My New Year's resolution is not to make New Year's resolutions. I just do shit all year round. I implement things and I get results. When is the best time to invest in real estate? Whenever you can. Because I can tell you now, investing in real estate is very passive. There's nothing quick about it. Just finding the right property, getting a pre-approval, could be a month or two. Settlements, 60 days to 90 days. There's another three months. So one transaction could take you six months and if you're behind your tax returns and if you've got to unlock equity from another property, one transaction could be 12 months. So being super active in real estate investing is still very passive compared to things like the stock market or any other investment because it takes so long to transact. So forget about timing on the market. It's time in the market. Buy property whenever you can based on the key fundamentals in the area. And then when the market goes up, you just sit back and you're going to look really smart. That's, that's what's going to happen. If you try to time the market, and we are at the bottom right now, okay, so this is it. For those of you who are obsessed with timing the market, it's still not a good investment strategy because it only happens once every eight to 10 years that we, have, we are at the bottom of the market that we can identify clearly. Don't wait to buy an investment property. Buy an investment property and wait. And that was said by myself, Conrad Bobilak. That's my quote. So let's talk about property cycles. We know they're cyclical in nature, hence the term property cycle. We have the peak of the property market, decline of the property market, then we've got the bottom of the property market, and then we've got the growth part of the property market and the peak again. We are currently right at the bottom of the property market. So we have prices that are, well, we have prices that are falling. They're actually increasing now. We've passed the bottom because we have increasing lead uh, yields and undersupply of rental properties. Um, so we're kind of at the moment here, we've really passed the bottom. We definitely have de construction decreasing, especially in the apartment industry. Apartments are virtually dead in Melbourne. House and land estates are not selling. Um, but the difference is this time around is the volume of stock is virtually non-existent in key suburbs. If you go to Melbourne and you type in East Melbourne, you type in Ormond McKinnon, <coughs> um, West Melbourne, if you type in um, places like South Yarra, there's virtually six to 10 houses on the market, if that. And there should be 30 to 80 in those suburbs. So people are not selling properties anymore. They're holding onto properties longer and longer. And so now it's the bottom of this property cycle. You wanna get in and theoretically there should be bargains everywhere. They're not there. They're not simply not there. You know, and that's, that's what, so for those people that have waited for five years to time the bottom of the market, well, we're here right now, the bargains are just not there. The bargains were actually, some bargains were, were here two years ago when we were going down and everything was very negative. Even before the election, when people thought Labor's going to come in, thank God they didn't, those lemmings. But if, they, if the Socialist Party were to come in, or Labor Party, and win the elections, it would have been a disaster for the property market. But if they were to come in, um, that would have really stuffed things, st stuffed things up. So people were very negative leading up to the election. So there were some bargains then. Now, forget it. I mean, there's nothing out there. I've been going to property auctions in Melbourne and I've seen people pay way above reserve for detached houses, but only for detached houses, not for apartments. So where are we in the property cycle currently? We're actually at the bottom of the market. We're here. According to Harrington White Valuers, which is the national property clock, going into an upward trend. And this is what's interesting about it is we are at the bottom. We are going very quickly into an upturn in the property cycle. 
Is that really relevant? Is it that important? It's just information. To me as an investor, it's not that important um, because I know now the best time to buy was around here. Because two years ago, a year ago, this is where the bargains were. Now they're virtually dried up. So even though we are technically at the bottom of the cycle, it doesn't give you that advantage. The reason we know we are at the bottom of the cycle is because we know that there's been a, and this is for all the major capital cities, we can see the red line is the upper quartile of the property market. So these are the most expensive properties and the most expensive suburbs. They are leading the recovery this time around. We have the middle market properties, which is the black line, which is what majority of people can afford. So properties around, and look, it depends on the state, but in Melbourne, it's around the 650 to 950 mark. They've also recovered. And the blue line is the lower quartile, which is the cheapest properties. They're also going up. So you can see there, the bottom was around about, you know, February, March 2019. And we've definitely now are coming up like we did in the last property cycle. Now, we could have a double dip, depending on what's happening in the economy and what happens with the monetary policy and interest rates. But interest rates are getting cut even further. I mean, we're down to literally historically unprecedented lowest possible point in interest rates, which is 1% for bank swap rates. I mean, I'm seeing variable rates of, you know, we're going to see a lot of interest rates with the two in front of it, 2.99, 2.89. I'm doing, we're seeing a lot of clients getting 3.16, 3.26. I mean, virtually everything is cash flow positive. Rental yields are 4% and you're getting funding for 3.2, 3.5%. It's a no-brainer. So we're definitely at the bottom. We've passed the bottom and we are going now into recovery. And you can see there also, this is a long-term view. This is from January 2004, then we've had the last two property peaks. And you can see that we're moving sideways for a while and we're definitely going into recovery. How far up we go will be determined by time. I don't have a, you know, a crystal ball, love to have one. Um, but does it really make any difference to me as an investor? No, because everything I have keeps going up by eight to 10% per year because I've never speculated on any of the areas that I invested in. I've only bought in blue chip areas with proven capital growth, long-term history. So if you do that and you stick to the key fundamentals, um, you won't go wrong. <coughs> I often say to people, I'd rather overpay for a really good property than underpay for a bad one. Let me repeat that. I'd rather overpay for a really good property, even 10%, than underpay, get a bargain, for a really bad property. I'd rather overpay 10% in Bentley and pay 1.1 million instead of 1 million and have negative equity for 12 months than get a real bargain in Melton because nothing's gonna happen in Melton. You know, there's no income demographics there and Bentley's always gonna go up because everyone wants to live there. It's bordering on the best suburbs in Melbourne, on the beach with the best schools in Melbourne, best shopping in Melbourne. So, you know, this thing about getting market timing is kind of irrelevant. You've got to get that out of your psychology as soon as you can because it's holding you back. And let me ask you something. If you have that psychology, how many properties do you have? If you've got one or two properties, that's not the right psychology. If you've got 10 or 15, sure. If you've got maybe that works for you, then stick to it. Don't change a thing. But I guarantee you, those people that listen to this YouTube video right now who still hold that psychology of getting in at the bottom of the market, which is theoretical, I can tell you now, you haven't got many properties if you still believe that. So yeah, everyone's forecasting really good growth. This is from ANZ, forecast for 2020. You can see Melbourne there for 2020, which is the blue um, table here. And the growth will be, for the next 12 months, around the 5% mark. So we're definitely going from a negative growth to positive growth. The last peak of the property cycle was November 2017. And we've had negative growth since November 2017 until the last quarter. We've had 1% positive growth, hence the uh, turn in the market. So what's really happened in property um, suburbs in the last property cycle? See, in real estate investing, past performance is always an indicator of future performance. Unlike the stock market, where, com where companies can go down, be completely delisted, um, like you can be... You know, you, there's so many hundreds of companies every year that go bankrupt or get delisted off the stock exchange. Look at the last 20 years. Look at the ASX top 200. How many companies have been merged, acquired by other companies, or just went out of business, you know, and including some blue chip companies. 
So in the stock market, past performance is not an indicator of future performance because you can be become obsolete by the technology, by all different things. Look at Nokia. Nokia used to be on top, now Nokia is irrelevant. How many of you guys are using Blackberries now? None of you, right? Everyone's using iPhones. Well, 10 years ago, it was all Blackberries, you know? The thing about real estate, it's different. Real estate past performance is always virtually a guaranteed indicator of future performance because income demographics don't change. The suburb doesn't change. You know, if you go to Hawthorne, the architecture, the blocks, the income demographics, the schools, they don't change. No one's going to say, oh, you know what? We don't like mansions and good schools anymore. That's so old 90s. Let's go over here, you know, wear a bulletproof vest. And, uh, and, you know, battle out with these locals. That's never going to happen, you know. So with, with suburbs, they never change. In fact, what happens in Melbourne and Sydney is the most expensive suburbs become more expensive at a higher rate than the poorer suburbs, which is counterintuitive as well because you think there'd be a spillover effect. There actually isn't. Like Melton, Trigonino and Frankston North are not going as, uh, are growing at around 2% 2, 2 per year, 3% per year, compared to some areas in Melbourne like Balaclava that's growing 11 12% per year, or Richmond, for example, which is counterintuitive, right? You would think that that has to slow down, this has to catch up. It doesn't because it's based on household income. These people in Frankston North make a fraction of what people make in Richmond per week. In, fact, in Frankston North, people make on average around 400 bucks a week. In, in Richmond, they make 2500 per week per person. So there's a big difference in income. Therefore, they have the greater propensity to push up property prices. Last property cycle, we had Brighton, Turek, and Canterbury and East Melbourne lead the property cycle. Right? This is 2007. And you can see the, the suburbs in red are suburbs that represent million-dollar suburbs. And there's a spillover effect that happens consistently with, within each market. There's no spillover effect between markets, but within each market... There's consistent spillover effect. You have Q, Eaglemont, Baldwin, North, you know, Glenaris, and then it keeps going down, you know, as we speak. So you have Park Orchards, Donvale, you know, Templestowe, all these areas hit a million dollars, 2015, 2016. And then what happened in 2017? As new suburbs like Vermont South and Glenway Avery and Willis Hill were hitting a million, the other suburbs were hitting two million and three million dollars. Now, what do you think is going to happen? And then when we hit 2017, we had the peak of the market in November in Melbourne. That was it. Then the suburbs went backwards slightly. So you can see there, the red patches represent suburbs that went backwards the most between 2017 and 2018. Now, people go, I love the media. You know, they're going, Turak lost 20%, Brighton lost 20%. Yeah, he did. But it went up by a bloody lot before then. It's like saying, oh, you slowed down by 50 k's an hour. Yes, but I was going 300 k's in my Porsche 911. I'm still doing 250 k's an hour. It's still freaking fast compared to 100 k's an hour. So just, nothing can be just, nothing can go up, in, you know, exponentially indefinitely. There's no such thing. Things can go up and they've got to slow down, even go back a little bit and then go up again, which is what happens with the blue chip areas. So yeah, we have the peak of the market, the top end, the upper quartile, definitely people take properties off the market and the median price goes down by 10, 15, 20%. That happens every property cycle without question. It doesn't mean that every house in Brighton, Turak, Canterbury devalues. It just means that the volume gets reduced because rich people take their unencumbered houses off the market. They don't need to sell those properties if they don't choose to. That's exactly what happened. Now, we're in 2019, new property cycle. Bang, we're going back up again. So we're going to see the following suburbs start off the property cycle again, like they did in 2007. We're going to see the following suburbs. We're going to see Canterbury, you know, Malvern, Turek, Brighton. We're going to see these areas start the next property cycle. So go, go and buy them. This is it, guys. For those who are waiting at the bottom of the market, this is it. They're only going to go up from here. And they're going up already, you know? So all those engineering people that are obsessed with Excel spreadsheets and timing of the market, this is your time. Go nuts.
That's why I say to people, just buy whenever you can. Buy whenever you can. Because monetary policy, interest rates, everything keeps changing. And sometimes you can borrow a lot of money. Sometimes you can't borrow money. And your personal life will change. Sometimes your life will be perfect financially. And sometimes you're going to have some weird thing happen, whether it's a medical condition or your business suffers or something happens in your life where you have a couple of years of really bad financials and you can't borrow money to buy property. You know, So my advice is don't wait for the market. Buy property and then wait. That's the best advice I can give you guys. Capital price changes in terms of what's happening in Melbourne. So we've had the first quarter for the year, we had negative 7.7% growth. Mind you, property has doubled and tripled and quadrupled in Melbourne. So, you know, 7%, wow, that's nothing. First positive sign of growth, 0.3% for the quarter. Melbourne median price, 818000 Sydney is 1032000 Still negative territory. Still hasn't changed. It's going negative 9.1%. Brisbane. People are keep asking about Brisbane. Is Brisbane going to happen? No, I don't believe Brisbane is going to boom at all. I think it's going to have okay growth. There's just no money in Brisbane, guys. That's the problem. All the heads of corporations, if you look at the, the biggest companies in Australia that contribute the biggest amount towards the GDP, number one is the banking and financial services sector. Where are all the heads of corporations? Where are all the people? They're all in Sydney and Melbourne. There's none of them in Brisbane. Number two, commodity sector. Where is the heads of the corporations? BHP, Rio Tinto, where are they all? Melbourne and Sydney. There's just no money in Brisbane. That's the problem. There's nothing wrong with Brisbane. It's a great town, great city to live in. Yes, there will be areas with good growth, but it doesn't have the same challenges of massive population growth versus limited supply that Melbourne has. And that's why you haven't got the same pressure on housing. And that's why I don't believe Brisbane's going to boom. And there's a lot of experts predicting it's going to boom. I just don't believe it's going to happen. So, you know, um, I hope I am wrong, honestly, because I want you guys to make money. You know, I've got no stock in Brisbane. I've, I'm not a developer. So I, I actually honestly hope that I'm wrong, but I, everything that I'm reading and my gut instincts based on all the information is leading towards Brisbane's not going to happen. It's going to have okay growth, nothing special. In terms of uh, medium prices in Melbourne, if you look at house prices for the quarter, you have different distinctive markets in Melbourne. You have the inner property in the east, southeast, or inner south, northeast, northwest, outer east, southeast, west. They're all very different markets. You have the northwest doing 4%, and you've got the inner east doing minus 3.6. Now, why is that? Because majority of these properties are big mansions. Where in the western suburbs, you have reasonably cheap, or in the northwest, you've got cheap houses. You know, probably the cheapest houses in Melbourne. So different markets, no correlation between them, growing at different rates, doing very different things. Um, same with apartments. By the way, don't even, don't even um, you know, um, don't touch apartments at all. I just wouldn't, wouldn't go there. Um, so where are the best properties to target in Melbourne in 2019? For those of you here listening to this for the first time, you haven't watched any of my videos, and you're thinking, you know what, Melbourne sounds pretty good. I want to invest in Melbourne. What do you do? Apartments, number one. Don't touch apartments, okay? Why? I'll tell you why. Mascot, New South Wales. Look what happened with that apartment building that's condemned now. All those people were asked to leave and they were basically evicted from their own property. Imagine though, that couple that bought that two better for 800 grand. Now they can't move back in. They can't sell it. They can't leverage against it. I mean, they just have to wait now for the, virtually for the government to intervene and bail them out because the company, the original builder and the company don't have enough funds to fix that project. Now, that's just one of many examples. What's going to happen if the government starts having an inquiry into all apartment construction around Australia? And a lot of these apartments around St Kilda, where my office is, suddenly they're going to start looking into how they were constructed by whom, and they're going to start doing proper inspections and find out half of this stock or 10% or 15% of this stock is, is completely um, structurally unsound. Imagine if you're an investor and you've got 600 to a million tied up in, a, in an apartment project. What are you going to do? I mean, that could end your whole journey in property investing. So I say to people, there's nothing wrong with apartments. I have them. There's nothing wrong with them. Don't buy any more until there's, number one, strong recovery in the apartment sector as a minimum, which we have never seen in Melbourne and Sydney in the last 10 years. And number two, we have this issue solved with, with um, you know, these structural integrity issues being solved. And cladding as well is another issue. 
In Melbourne, we have a record amount of apartments being constructed, and now we're seeing a lot of projects being shelved. The blue buildings represent future projects, by the way. Some of these towers have three, 400 apartments being built. And look, in Melbourne, no one wants to live in the city, by the way. A lot of these towers are ghost towers sold overseas to Singapore, China, and no one wants to rent them, you know? Um, people in Melbourne want to live in St Kilda, West Melbourne, Brunswick. They don't want to live inside the city itself, you know? And there's a tsunami of residential apartment construction with building defects and concerns that the cladding will make it hard for apartment owners to sell and to revalue and get equity out. And this is what buyers should look for if you want to get a bargain. So if you want to get a real bargain, what you should look for is Art Deco older apartments in a small complex where there's like six or ten apartments, two levels, massive block of land. Built 100 years ago or 70 years ago, depending on the period, yeah, that's probably a good investment. Around Melbourne and Sydney, there's all the suburbs. That I would target, especially for renovation purposes, but brand new, forget about it. I mean, I wouldn't touch apartments, I would recommend them. It's, it's a complete disaster of what's happening in the industry. The difference in price rises between houses and apartments was the most stark in Abbotsford, which is a great area for apartments in Melbourne, but the difference in capital growth, apartments and houses that are detached, 88% gap. South Yarra, 73% gap, and Parkfield, 79% gap over the last 10 years. So people buy apartments in areas they can't afford to buy a house, like Hawthorne, because they want access to the best schools, transport, location, proximity to the city, shopping, everything prestige. But their apartments in Hawthorne are actually not growing at all because they're creating thousands of them. Not thousands, but hundreds and hundreds. And even though houses in Hawthorne are going up by 8, 9, 10% per year, Apartments are growing at 1% to 2% per year and sometimes going negative after 10 years. We've seen apartments in Melbourne, especially Docklands and South Bank, where people have paid six fifty dollars for a two-bedder 10 years ago and now they're revaluing the property and it's coming at five eighty. So it's negative 70000 growth in 10 years and they're paying four and a half grand per year in body corporate fees. It's insanity, guys. It's, in, it's craziness. Just speak to mortgage brokers before you buy apartments. They'll show you some of the valuations that people, what people have paid for and what they're coming in now. There's virtually no equity in them. Now, long term, yes, probably they'll make sense because if you look at New York, Manhattan, that's the future of Melbourne eventually. As more population, millions of people come to Melbourne, eventually we're going to have to live in the city in high-density apartments. Yes, in the future, absolutely. But it's not going to happen in the next 10 years or 20 years. So if you want to build a large property portfolio, you don't want to be wealthy when you're 98, right? You want to be wealthy in your 30s and 40s. You need the equity in your property to go from one to another, and apartments just not the vehicle to get you there. And that's why the banks don't like apartments, and they've blacklisted postcodes in Melbourne. So Melbourne 3000 postcode is blacklisted for lending, which means you can't borrow above 80%, and in some instances, 70%. Melbourne 3004 postcode, World Trade Centre 3005, South Bank 3006, South Yarra Docklands and South Melbourne, blacklisted in Melbourne. Great suburbs, great location in terms of proximity to the city. South, South Melbourne's fantastic suburb, Clarendon Street, phenomenal schools, you know, everything's there. You're on the beach virtually, you know, one suburb away from the beach, blacklisted apartments, 70% LVR maximum, which means you've always got 30% equity locked up in that property. Why would you go there? You know, it's a disaster. People keep buying South Melbourne apartments, hoping and praying to God, please make it go up in value. I just want that red Ferrari. You're going to be very disappointed. If you are going to buy an apartment, you have to have a three-to-one ratio between the price of a two-bedroom apartment and the detached house. So Turek, for example, a detached house is $3 million. That's the median price. A two bed is 670, 3, 3.4546% ratio between the price. So that means the person that's looking for Turek, the complete price out of the detached housing market, they're either going to buy a two bed and live in Turek or not live in Turek at all. There's no correlation between these two markets. Okay? So where apartments don't work is Caroline Springs. You've got houses for 700, two bed for 600. It's $100,000 difference between a backyard and a four-bedroom house versus a two-bedroom apartment. How's it going to work? Why would people build apartments in Caroline Springs? It's beyond me. They keep building them there. They can't get sales. People keep buying, and they can't get equity out of them. Just don't do it, guys. Be smarter. So, you know, you've got Turex and Kilda West, East Melbourne, Kew Glen Iris, you know, Hawthorne, Middle Park. 
you know, Albert Park, all the typical suburbs, you know, Brighton, Sandringham, Blackrock, with the median price of a detached house. This doesn't apply for townhouses, by the way. Townhouses are the same as houses. In fact, a lot of townhouses are being built now in the best suburbs of Melbourne, like Richmond, are bigger than the original houses that were being built there. So, so townhouses and houses, virtually the same thing. Apartments, very different. Apartments, obviously, they have no land component. You're in, in the air. You're on top of each other. Stay away from them. Stay away from them like a Kenny G con concert. House and land, complete disaster in Melbourne, okay? The stories are fantastic. These companies are so clever in their marketing. The brochures, the capital growth, the Melbournes. The, they just get all the suburbs in Melbourne and just you get a big pot and just, you know, get all Turex and Hawthorns and Brightons. Let's just mix them up with Melton and Trigonino and Point Cook and pack it. It's all part of Melbourne. No, it's not. No, it's got nothing to do with Melbourne, okay? <laughs> Developers are hoarding 30, 13 years worth of supply to boost prices in Melbourne because they know if they release supply, the whole industry will just dissolve and properties will plummet. So, I mean, look, these developers are very smart. I mean, these are, these are multi-billion dollar companies that have operated, some of them for over 100 years, like Pete, for example. Great builder, great developer. Metricon, fantastic. You know, in terms of the build quality, Phenomenal, right? Love Metricon. However, these are publicly listed companies. So you can check all this information yourself. If you look at, um, for example, let's go for Pete. So average number of lots sold per year, 2,623. Average number of lots held in land banking, 44,000. They've got 17 years of stock they're holding back from the market because they know if they release them, the whole market will plummet in value. So they just hold back stock and not release it, try to, in a way, influence the supply part of the equation. Because really, at the end of the day, the property market is very simple. It's based on supply and demand. But the demand has to come from the right income demographics. Where capital growth is created is we have high income demographics wanting something they can't get a hold of, and that's why they pay a premium price for it. These are states, you have a low income demographic, so it's irrelevant demand. But if you look at, for example, um, in a land lease, massive builder, right? They sell 2,960 lots per year. They're holding back 46,000 lots, which is 16 years worth of land banking supply. So you've got the issue now of these developers. They know it's the worst time in the market to sell house and land, so they're holding back stock, releasing small amounts in each estate, try to create supply and demand equation in their favour, which is a smart thing to do, by the way. And this is exactly what I would do if I was a developer. But just so you understand, this is actually manipulating the market, where in St Kilda, there is literally no one holding back any stock. There is just six houses on the market, and that's it. Okay? This is holding back stock and manufacturing demand. The other suburbs, they actually have no stock. So... Let me ask you something. When the market recovers, what do you think they're going to do with this stock? They're going to keep releasing it. And that's why these areas, these so-called growth corridors, have massive gluts of properties in them, like Hoppers Crossing, Trigonina, Tummy, Cranbourne, Sandhurst, Sky, Doreen, Moonda, Derrimid, Point Cook, Werribee, Pakenham, Pakenham South, Melton, Melton West, Roxborough Park, Craigieburn, Clyde, Clyde North, Epping. They have thousands of blocks, and that's why the growth over the last 10 years, this is to November 2017, by the way, back 10 years. So from the last peak back, they grew on average, if you look at off Melton, 2.5% per year. Now, the, the inflation has been 3.5, 3.75. So these areas are going below inflation. Unless you're doing a 3.7 ton eight, you're still going below inflation. And if you're going at inflation, you're not actually making any money, you're just keeping up pace. So you're not eroding your equity base. So you've got, you know, um, Wyndham, Williams Landing, right? All this, all this BS about Williams Landing, how all of Turex is going to sell up and move to Williams Landing suddenly. Capital growth, 3.2%. Below inflation over 10 years. Can you imagine? Um, Geelong, people keep asking me about Geelong. I love Geelong aesthetically, and then the community of Geelong is great, and the schools are great, and you've got the beach and the architecture. There's just no money in Geelong. That's the problem. 
That's why you haven't got that growth. Yes, there's always going to be suburbs in Geelong that will double every 10 years because every city, regional area, um, or satellite city, if you like, which is kind of what Geelong is, have the best suburbs where they have the best location. But in terms of parking all your money in Geelong, if you live in Geelong, yeah, have your house there, maybe an investment property, but then move and park some of your money in Melbourne where you are going to get 10, 15% growth, you know? Point Cook, 3.5% growth. You know, all these stories about Point Cook, how it's the best estate and all this other stuff and all the stories. Well, where, where are all the people now that have bought last year and the year before? Do you know how many blocks of Point Cook are currently on the gum tree where they were bought, bought by a taxi driver and now they can't sell them, can't settle them because they'll lose 40 grand. They're trying to offload them. There's something like 6,000 blocks on the, on the market of house and land estates in Melbourne. People are trying to offload them because they can't settle Guys, you have to be smarter than this. You know, this is why I'm doing these videos. I want to save you the pain of making these mistakes. And the theme about this is, look at what majority of people are doing, just do the opposite. Because most people get it wrong. Most people do not retire wealthy. Listen to investors like myself. We do the exact polar opposite of virtually what everyone does. And it's counterintuitive. A lot of this stuff is not intuitive. It's not intuition, you know? So, you know, and the biggest postcode stress, and these are postcodes where they have 90 days in arrears with their mortgage. So if you miss three mortgage repayments, three months, technically the bank can repossess your house and sell it. So where are these stressed postcodes in Melbourne? Where well, they're in Wallet, you know. People are building houses. Have you been past South Morang? There's kangaroos there. Why would you? There's nothing there. And Lower Plenty Road is a car park to pick out traffic. You know if you live anywhere around here, you can't get to the city. It takes you an hour and a half to get to the city. I mean, the building houses up here, I don't know who's going to live there. There's going to be no growth there. Forget about growth, you know, for the next 100 years. So, yeah, for your grand-grandchildren, it's going to be awesome. That has a mortgage stress of 20.3%. 20% of the houses are three months in arrears with their mortgage. Lynhurst, Lynbrook. Okay, which, which is 3975, also have 18.4% of properties which mortgage stress. Craigieburn, Roxborough Park, okay, this area here, 3064, three massive mortgage stress, 17.9%. Donnybrook, okay, Plumpton, I mean, Clyde, Clyde North, this area here, 16.8%. If you look at mortgage stress in Black Rock, zero. If you look at mortgage stress in Balaclava, zero. Mortgage stress in Williamstown, 1%. Mortgage stress means property is going to be repossessed by the banks and sold quickly without any marketing, with minimum marketing. They're usually sold below reserve. So imagine what that does to your investment properties as a price point, as a future reference point. It's a disaster. you know. And no one talks about this. Everyone's so scared to talk anything about the property market that's negative. Have you noticed that? All the experts are so positive or conservative. Well, it's growing up you know, now, but uh, in the future, we're not going to see this growth. We're so politically correct now, and we're becoming such a nanny state, I'm just sick of it. You know, um, Everyone's scared to talk about stuff because it's going to offend someone. You know, Nothing's going to happen if you get offended, guys. You don't die. You know? you know what I'm offended by? Boy groups. Boy groups offend me. One direction offends me. So shut them down. I hate listening to them on the radio if they randomly come up. You know, boy groups offend me. That's what offends me. People that shouldn't be in the music industry. Townhouses are it. That's your vehicle to building wealth because you've got a house in an area that's an infill area. Okay, I mean, you can buy townhouses anywhere, but I'm talking about townhouses in, in areas that are established. They have the best income demographics, so highest income per household. I'll show you which, which ones. Best schools in Melbourne and very good proximity to the city and the water. Melbourne is always priced by distance to the city and the water in the right part of Melbourne with the right schools and income demographics. So if you look at the best areas in Melbourne for 10% for growth for the last 10 years, and this is basically, if you look at this, in Melbourne, they're all in the eastern suburbs. Mont Albert, 11.8% growth. Baldwin North, Middle Park, Bayside, obviously. Mont Albert North, Ashburton, Glen Waverley, Baldwin, Doncaster, Burwood. You know, it's all Bayside in the eastern suburbs. So you can, if you can't afford to get a house there, you can definitely get a townhouse. Um, now, people say townhouses won't grow up as much as a house because they've got a small land component. 
No, that's not true. People don't care about the block of land anymore, guys. They want the privacy of a townhouse where they can drive into the garage and go straight to the kitchen or the living area without interacting with people in the, like in the apartment block. But no one cares about backyards anymore. As long as there's a tiny courtyard there, you can put a barbecue in a table. That's cool. But what people love about townhouses is affordability factor. For example, this is from, from back to 2017, which was the peak of the market. If you look at Q East, the average median for a townhouse was 910,000, for a house, 1.7 million. Now, a townhouses grew by 38% in 12 months, where houses by 0.06. Why? Less people can afford these, more people can afford that. So people want to live in Q East, which is pretty much kids that grew up in Q but can't afford Q, they go to Q East, that's what they're targeting because now they've got their jobs, they're making 80 to 100 grand each, Young couple, can't afford Q, can't afford two million to three. Let's go for 910. Um, Moorabbin, 600 grand, 36% growth versus detached houses, 13% growth, which is a million and five. If you look at, the Heidelberg Heights is an awesome area. And this is one of the, the top areas that I'm targeting right now. And I'm gonna do a video on Heidelberg Heights, Heidelberg West, which is an area of ex-housing commission that's close to the city, close to the hospital precinct in Melbourne, very good schools in the area and surrounded by top suburbs like Ivanhoe, Eaglemont, um, Heidelberg, which are very, very good upper middle class suburbs, big houses, great schools, but you've got this pocket of these two suburbs that were ex-housing commission 10 years ago and now they're getting redeveloped into townhouses and they're really changing in terms of demographics. And even just driving around through the streets, I'm seeing more and more brand new townhouses popping up and you can see the couples that live there very different to the couple that were already renting there, you know, through the government scheme um, of uh, the Housing Commission Trust. Williamstown North as well, you know, houses, 1 million 90. Townhouses, 546, 28% growth. So townhouses take advantage of the area at a fraction of the price and have massive capital growth because more people can afford to live there and there's more pressure on them. And that is your number one vehicle. So if you don't know where to start building your wealth, Townhouses, best suburbs of Melbourne, and the most expensive that you can afford to buy in the best suburbs that you can buy. You don't need to spend a lot of money, guys. You know, you can get townhouses like, I mean, I wouldn't go to Sportswood necessarily, but you can get properties still in Heidelberg Heights, you know, two bedrooms for 550, three bedrooms for 650. Um, you're going to get really good growth for the next, th you know, three months, three years, I should say. Rents will increase significantly. In key suburbs in the next two years, rents are going up. And we can see that. The bottom was here. This is combined capital cities and regional centres. Rents are going up. And in Melbourne, definitely, 2019, 2018, you can see the 19, 3.7, 3.3% um, on average. But in the eastern suburbs in the bay side, now that people are priced out of the property market, I can see rents going up. The most important thing about all this is household income demographics. If you look at how much people are making per household individually, this is household weekly income. Park Orchards, 2,660 per household. Plenty, Cremon, which is Richmond, Ivanhoe East, Wonga Park, Canterbury, Waterways, Kangaroo Ground, Brighton, um, Wandenwood. If you look at individuals, you know, this is what I would look at. Individual household income would be the key determining factor in shortlisting your properties. Richmond's number one, two and a half grand per person. East Melbourne, Port Melbourne, Middle Park, Turek, Elwood, Elbert Park, St Kilda West, Clifton Hill, South Yarra. These are some of the top areas where people have extreme income. I mean, two and a half grand per week per person. You have massive discretionary income and there's virtually no stock on the market. So getting a townhouse in that area is the key. So just go down the list and whichever way you can buy, just get it, you know. It's the bottom of the cycle. We're only going to go up now. Just a question of by how, how much and how quickly. So what factors really determine and drive property prices? It's not location, location determine capital growth. If that were true, South Bank would be the most expensive real estate in Melbourne. It's 1K from the city, 1K from the water, on the water, on the river. Um, you know, it's actually scarcity, so lack of stock, which is the opposite of house and land, High demand, but the right income demographics, people with lots of income, surplus income they can spend on paying for properties above vendor reserve. That's what actually happens. 
Um, and in terms of growth, <laughs> excuse me for one second. How annoying. In terms of growth for the next three years, which are the top areas that I recommend investing in? And this is from Select Residential Property SRP, and I completely agree with most of their decisions. If you look at Balaclava's number one, 20% growth in three years. Um, this is for detached houses and townhouses. South Melbourne, not for apartments, guys. This is only for townhouses and houses. Uh, what's Sonia North, Carlton, Flemington, Gladstone Park, Hawthorne, Coburg North, St Kilda East and Collingwood. Really good returns. In a market that I think is going to do 3 to 4% next 12 months, you're getting here around the 7 to 8% mark. Because remember, we're still at the bottom of the cycle. We're not going to shoot up suddenly. That instant, that massive growth will occur at 9 o'clock on the property clock from 9 to 12 is where you're getting to see growth of 9, 10, 11% growth. Between six and nine o'clock, you're going to see a very gradual build-up in terms of momentum, as long as all the indicators are uh, in play, which is the key thing. Top suburbs to invest in 2019 and 20 for capital growth. If you look at upmarket Bayside, Albert Park, Port Melbourne, St Kilda, East West Balaclava definitely, Brighton, Bentley and Bentley East, Elwood, Hampton, Sandringham, Blackrock, Balmorris. They're the top ten. So if you got Unlimited budget, Albert Park, can't go wrong. Um, Balaclava, can't go wrong. Port Melbourne, can't go wrong. Uh, entry level suburbs, so cheaper suburbs basically Cheltenham, Hyatt, Mentone, Moriallic, Aspendale, Edenfell, Chelsea, Bond Beach, Chelsea Heights, and then Carrum, number 10. If you go to upmarket eastern suburbs, Mont Albert, Mont Albert North, Kew, Canterbury, Camberwell, Surrey Hills, Hawthorne, Baldwin, Baldwin North, Glen Mabley, top areas to invest in. And if you're looking at entry level, Box Hill, Box Hill North, Heidelberg Heights, especially around the hospital precinct and Heidelberg Heights and Heidelberg West are my favourite properties for growth as the underdog suburbs that are currently experiencing gentrification. And I can see the demographics changing in those areas completely. Blackbird, Burwood, Burwood East, Mitcham, Bayswater. Bayswater mainly for subdivisions. I wouldn't just buy and hold the townhouse in there. I'll go for houses for subdivision potential. And Doncaster, Doncaster East. That's it for the video, guys. I hope you learned a little bit. Interested in learning more? If you are, then I would like to personally invite you to spend two days with me and the other experts in the industry at my next Real Estate Fast Track Weekend. And all you gotta do is jump on this website here or scroll down below, there's a link under this video and you can reserve your tickets. Tickets are free, you can upgrade to VIP if you like, but the general tickets are free. I run about 10 of these events per year, um, roughly every six weeks. Um, I take most of December off and first two weeks of January because I go for holidays, but um, so I do run them here, right here in St Gilda in my office. And these are events where I have one day of just finance and research and due diligence in a classroom environment, which is just a lot of information, most of it on finance and structuring your property portfolio. And day two, we actually take you physically onto a bus and we drive you around Melbourne to show you some of the top end suburbs and talk about capital growth and areas you should be targeting and areas you should be avoiding. So really good two days here in, uh, in my office. So more than welcome to um, register. I guarantee you're gonna get your time worth for attending that event. People have learned a lot of information during the two events. Also, for those who are interested in reading up more about finance, check out my book, um, which is now a bestseller by going to bookonfinance.com.au or Amazon um, or any book, good bookshop around Australia. Also, as a bonus, for those who cannot make it to my live event, um, I'm going to give you a free home study which you can instantly access and have 10 hours of instant information at your fingertips just right after watching this video right now. It's absolutely free. There's no, no strings attached, no upsell, nothing. And it's literally very easy to navigate through. It's basically 10 hours of video. I think it's about 12 now because I've graded the finance section. I got Stephen McClutchy to do a new section last year. And there's a manual there. And it's about... Um, it's free instant access. All you've got to do is scroll down below and click the link underneath this video. Um, and it's literally a whole home study. Um, it's absolutely free access and includes a 265 page manual that you download and follow through all the information. And it's, it's everything that took me to learn 
over the last 10, 15 years. So there's a lot of content there. I hope you enjoy it. That's it from me, guys. This is Conrad Bobby Lake. Thank you for staying with me for the end of the video. I hope you enjoy that free gift at the end. Take advantage of it. And guys, remember, don't wait to buy property. Buy property and wait. This is Conrad Bobby Lake. I'll see you on the inside.